Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to today's Woodland Wildland Webinar Series program. It's June 6, 2013. My name is Andrew Quinn, and we're privileged to have Brian Eiler with us today to talk about deer management in Maryland. I have a few things to go through before we turn things over to Brian. And tell you a little bit about everything that's going on today. Sorry, we had a short interruption. We're, we're still here. Um, as I said, we're, we're uh, on June 6, 2013, and for those of you who've been with us before, welcome back, and if you're new to our webinar series, welcome. We're happy to have you with us. Today we're going to have Brian Eiler with us talk a little bit about deer management in Maryland, but before we get started, we have a few things to go over first. This is part of a webinar series that we do throughout the year. We're going to be taking the summer off, but then we'll probably start it up again in the fall. If you'd like to learn how to, uh, how to find out when these are going to be held and uh, the topics, the easiest thing to do is to join our webinar's email notification list. You can send an email to listserv at listserv.umd.edu, or you can contact me directly. Andrew Kling, that's at akling1 at umd.edu. And what we do is we send out a notification a couple days before the webinar to let you know what the topic is, what time it's going to be held, and how to log in. And after the webinar is over, after we've gotten the recording taken care of, we also send out a, a notification to let everyone know where the webinar is. And we try to get these uh, recordings up for everyone to see as quickly as possible. It usually takes a few days, but uh, as I said, we send out an email to let everyone know when it's actually going to, uh, going to be available and the address. And we usually ask people to log on 10 to 15 minutes early. The reason we do that is we're limited by bandwidth to 100 participants to join us for the webinar. And all of the webinars are recorded and they're on our YouTube channel. Uh, easiest way to find that is to go to YouTube and search for Woodland Wildlife Webinar. You'll find us there. And we have a number of other webinars that we've recorded and another, a number of other videos that might be of interest to you. So not just the, the webinars that we have here. And they're also available on our website. If you spent some time with us, you may have spent a little bit of time wandering around our old website. Now, this one is obsolete. We don't use this one anymore. Uh, it has gone away, and our brand spanking new website looks like this. Uh, we've had a slight rebranding of our name. We used to be the Forest Stewardship Education Program. Now we're the Woodland Stewardship Edu Education Program. Same group of people, uh, Nevin Dawson, Nancy Stewart, Bob Jaden, Jonathan Kays, and myself. Uh, just a slight uh, rebranding, if you will. Uh, what we did a couple of months ago was create this new website, which now has uh, a consistent identification with the University of Maryland Extension and the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, so that all of the AGNR programs have this same basic look with the red and black of the University of Maryland. And what you'll do when you go to extension.umd.edu slash woodland is you can go over on the right-hand side, and you'll see a green tab that says Resources. And down here, there is a link to webinar recordings, and that's where you'll find all of the different recordings that we've done for webinars throughout the year, as well as a great deal of information from other sources. If you have a question during the webinar, the easiest way to get a hold of us is through the chat box down in the left-hand corner. You'll notice that there's a way to send a question to everyone. We'll see that as well as everyone who's participating, or you can send a question directly to any one of the, uh, any one of the participants or the presenters just themselves. If we have time, we can get to the question during the presentation. If not, we'll get to it towards the end. And if for some reason we, we get off on a tangent, we don't get uh, a chance to answer your question directly, uh, you can 
email me and we'll answer the question later on. And any other questions you have about the, the webinar process or the, the topic at hand, just drop me a line once again at acling1 at umd.edu. Before we get started, before I hand things over to Brian, we have a few questions to, to ask. Find out where everyone's from and a little bit of information about you. These are real quick, doesn't take too long. Go ahead and open these to find out where people are from and what sort of interests you have in, uh, in the topic at hand today. You can see the results as we go along. So it looks like a number of people have found out from from our email blast, which is always a good thing to hear. Let me know that we're reaching people. And we'll let these go for a little bit longer and then we'll go ahead and close them and we'll we'll move on. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the first one. And it looks like we have every everyone's input from the second one. And the third one. And the fourth one. And 50-50 on hunting or trapping wildlife. And we'll go ahead and close the last one. Okay. I'm going to turn things over to Brian here in a minute, and he'll tell you a little bit about himself. But first, first thing we're going to do is uh, bring up his PowerPoint here, and uh, we'll get rid of my picture and bring up Brian so you can see who he is. And I'll turn things over to Brian. He'll tell you a little bit about deer management in Maryland. Well, thank you, Andrew. I'd like to thank the Maryland Extension for, for having us here to talk today, and thank everybody out there for for tuning in. Um, you'll have to bear with me. This is my first webinar, and it is definitely different than giving a live presentation, but I'll get through it as best I can. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about deer management in Maryland. We'll start off with some basic biology, uh, talk a little bit about history, and then go into some management. It looks like uh, most of you tuning in um, are smaller owners. Uh, not a lot of land as far as from a management perspective, so we'll, we'll briefly at the end talk little bit about that, but I won't go into real depth um, since most of you are, are small acreage property owners. So just to start with, um, just some basic biology. Um, deer do have social groups, do maintain social groups with a social hierarchy. Um, the deer you see, um, typically uh, the groups will be a matriarchal dam and her offspring and her offspring's offspring. Uh, bucks largely are solitary, although during the summer they will maintain bachelor bands. Um, deer have a finite home range. Um, they're not out there wandering across the landscape. Um, typically, an adult female will have about a square mile home range, and, and adult males will be will be slightly larger than that. Uh, in November, during the breeding season, uh, the males can have a much larger range um, as they're uh, searching for females. But but overall, it's around a square mile. Um, deer traditionally were nocturnal, although anymore it's not uncommon to see deer day, night, or, or whenever. Um, Deer do bed. Um, they're ruminants um, with a compound stomach, so to, to allow that digestion process to work, um, they do bed. Um, they don't bed during all day and then up all night. It's a, it's a cycle. So they'll bed some during the day, then they'll be up during the day, and then they'll bed some during the night, and then they'll be up you know, during the night as well, um, browsing and feeding, and then, again, letting that, that rumination take place. Since they are ruminants, um, they can make use of a wide variety of, of food, um, whether it's fruits, nuts, um, acorns are a big part of their diet, um, farmers' crops, including uh, corn, uh, soybean, alfalfa, um, and even poison ivy and honeysuckle. Um, they eat a wide variety of materials. Uh, a little bit of breeding biology. Um, for those of you that have, that have property or have deer around, you've probably seen these common deer signs. Uh, deer will make rubs on trees. Um, they do this to communicate with other deer species. Um, and they also do this as a way to indicate their uh, their breeding cycle. Um, during the uh, 
in September when antlers harden, they will uh, rub the velvet off using these smaller trees like this. And, and if you're a, if you're a nursery owner or trying to trying to grow small trees, this can be problematic sometimes. Deer also make scrapes. Um, a lot of times, this will be a shrub uh, with a twig hanging down where the deer will deposit scent, and they use this to communicate with other deer. And then there will be a bare area underneath this where the where it's pawed and cleared out, and then the deer will actually urinate in these areas. And again, it's a way to time uh, the breeding cycle and to communicate what deer are in the area. And, and what's their breeding status. Peak breeding, as I mentioned, is the first two weeks in November. There's a 220-day a roughly gestation period. So peak fawning is right now, actually. Late May and early June is when most of the fawns in Maryland will be dropped. Um, our females average two fawns per doe, and the sex ratio typically is about one to one for those offspring. Antlers, everybody knows Antlers, that's the big attraction to, for hunters and, and for other people. Um, antlers are bone. Um, they're actually one of the fastest growing, if not fastest growing, tissue in the animal kingdom. Uh, they begin growing in March, April, and they stop growing in September where, when they harden. Um, and then they shed them in January, February, and into March, and then they grow a new set the following year. Um, antlers are used for fighting. Uh, to establish dominance during breeding, and they're also used to for defense. Uh, size of antlers is dependent on age, nutrition, and genetics. Uh, as you know, as long as the deer isn't beyond its prime, so up to six, seven, eight years old, each new set of antlers typically will be larger than the previous set. Um, nutrition plays a big part in antler size. Um, if deer numbers are in check and the habitat is good, um, antler size will be larger than if and if deer are overpopulated and, and the habitat is degraded. And then genetics also plays a, a part in size as well. Shift gears a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about management history. Um, in pre-colonial times, deer were abundant. Um, they were important to Native American Eastern tribes. And they were legislatively protected in Maryland as early as 1729. Uh, it's interesting, the early laws on the book um, if you violated those laws, you were often fined in pounds of tobacco. Um, so you weren't paying dollars, you were, you were paying your fines in pounds of tobacco. So uh, in pre-colonial times, we probably did not have as many deer as what we have today, though. We probably have more deer on the landscape today than, than ever, um, particularly in Maryland. Move into the 1800s, deer were nearly extirpated, not only in Maryland, but but pretty much across the deer's range. Um, we had the Industrial Revolution, we had market hunting, reduced regulations, destruction of habitat, and, and in Maryland, deer were, were relegated to Garrett and Allegheny County for the most part. Um, so not a good time to be wildlife um, deer or otherwise. So Move into the 1900s to 1960s, that, you can think of that period as, as a period of protection and restocking. Um, the 1900s, people started to recognize the value in the environment. Out of Leopold, we had the first green, green movement, excuse me, and, uh, and wildlife started to be protected, including deer. Uh, 1902, there was no hunting of deer. The deer season was closed. Um, shortly thereafter, it was an antlered only or buck only season. Uh, hunting license requirement came in 1918 in Maryland, and there was a uh, great effort in restocking. Uh, again, not just Maryland, but, but pretty much across the deer's range. Deer were moved from, from out west, um, up and down the coast, and, and from within each state. Uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds, a military base, uh, had a substantial deer population, and deer were actually trapped out of Aberdeen and restocked elsewhere in, in Maryland. I should also point out that it was during this time um, that, that our hunters started to become ingrained with with the attraction or lure of the buck. Um, as we were trying to grow that population, we were protecting the female deer. Um, they were the ones that were given birth. They were the ones responsible for, for increasing the deer population. So the early laws uh, did not allow doe hunting or female hunting, um, and, and it was buck only hunting. And, and some, of that, uh, some of that mentality remains today, although the deer population currently is well beyond where we, we need to be protecting females. We actually need to be harvesting females to, to help control that deer population and manage it. 
1920s to the 1970s was a, was a period of population regrowth. Uh, we had deer refuges in Maryland established um, expressly to manage deer. Gwynbrook WMA was one of those outside of Baltimore. And we also had a big improvement in the habitat. Um, we had forest regrowth. Um, there was a lot of tree restorations and tree plantings. And urban and suburban developments started to increase. And, and those areas were actually prime deer habitat. So, so the population through the 20 or the 20s through the 70s uh, was, was starting to rebound. Um, early biologists had had no idea um, the magnitude that deer would recover and, and the problems that they would cause later. So the 1980s to the present, that's the period of exponential growth in, in the deer population. Uh, we, you know, the, those urban suburban areas would come in like this. Um, a lot of times it would take hunting out of the equation, um, and this was just prime deer habitat. Ag land mixed with forest woodlots, mixed with urban suburban areas with really good landscaping, and, uh, and deer just exploded um, in Maryland and, and across much of its range. So you put it all together, you have favorable habitat, few natural predators, uh, man, it, in, in Maryland, uh, you know, man is pretty much the only yeah, effective predator. Bears take some fawns, coyotes will take a few deer, and I imagine bobcats may take a few too, but, but by and large, man is the only natural predator. Um, we have a very mild climate. Um, we have very little winter kill of deer, so when you combine the three together, um, it's just a recipe for, for a lot of deer, and, and, and that's why we have the deer population that we have today. Looking at the population model, um, you can see this period of exponential growth that I mentioned through the 80s up through the 90s to the to around 2000. Um, we became the Department of Natural Resources became very aggressive with seasons and bag limits. And in this time frame, we managed to bring that population down and stable it, uh, stabilize it. But we still have many, many deer. About 230,000 uh, is the current estimate, or, or 30 to 40 per square mile. And there's urban and suburban areas um, that's you know, much higher than that. I, I don't have to tell most of you to tune in. And, and they, those are the areas where deer uh, remain a, a significant issue or a significant problem. We have a lot of good deer in Maryland. Um, you know, Maryland isn't traditionally thought of as a big deer hunting state, but we have a lot of quality deer, and deer hunting is popular in the state. The uh, coastal plain soils around the Chesapeake Bay are some of the best soils in the country for growing big deer. And, uh, and even in Maryland, deer hunting is very popular and uh, very, very lucrative. Um, you know, it's a $220 million industry in Maryland last year, in 2011, the last time a survey was done, uh, $69 million in salaries, wages, and owner income, over 2,000 deer-related jobs and $17.5 million in state local tax revenue and $19 million in federal tax revenue. So, so there's a lot of dollars associated with deer and deer hunting in Maryland. Um, at the same time, it's a huge part of the Wildlife and Heritage Service budget, which, which is the, the organization I work for under Department of Natural Resources. 63% of our budget each year comes from special funds, which is mainly hunting license sales, which are, are by and large deer hunters. On top of that, 31% is matching federal aid for those hunting license sales. So 94% of, of the Wildlife and Heritage Service budget comes from hunting license sales, most of which are deer hunting. Um, so it's a huge part. And, and those dollars that come into the Wildlife and Heritage Service aren't just used to manage deer. They're used to manage all of the wildlife, game and non-game, in, in, in the state. So, so deer benefit a, a lot of other species uh, besides just hunters and, and hunting. Uh, on the flip side, though, I don't have to tell you the damage that, that deer are associated with. Deer vehicle collisions, crop damage, urban suburban issues, and, and forest damage from, from overpopulation. You know, we're all familiar with areas that look like this, devoid of any kind of an understory where deer have eaten everything. Um, that's, that's a serious issue. And, something that, that we, we all need to work on. So that's the flip side. So if, you look at, if you look at the dollars associated with the negative side of it, uh, crop damage, $7.5 million annually attributed to deer damage in Maryland. Uh, we have an estimated 34,000 deer vehicle collisions every year in the state at a projected cost of over $100 million annually. 
And then forest and landowner damage is hard to quantify, but, but no question it's in the millions of dollars. So that's what makes managing deer difficult in the state. Fifty years ago, it would have been fairly easy. We were trying to grow the deer population. We were trying to provide recreation for hunters, and we were solely managing for, for the hunter. Um, but but anymore, everybody has a vested interest in deer, whether whether it's positive or negative. Um, farmers, foresters, uh, soccer moms who might be concerned about Lyme's disease or hitting them with their car, um, animal rights sympathizers, or even other biologists who, who are concerned about the damage deer do and the negative impact they have on other wildlife species. So everybody rightfully has a, has a vested interest in deer and deer management in the state. I see we have a question from Doug who asked what would retail sales be. Retail sales were approximately 190 million. So 221 million was was with the ripples going through the economy, but but the actual straight retail sales was over 150 around 175 million if I remember right from that from that report. Correct. Yeah, all it, as far as retail sales yeah, to, to if, 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 if the question was what kind of retail sales, um, it's, it's ammunition, uh, maybe food supplies for a hunting trip, um, guns, et cetera, anything that, that's associated with deer, and, and not just from the hunting side of things, but even from a, from a wildlife side of things, maybe just viewing deer or traveling to a wildlife refuge, et cetera. But mainly it's, it's the hunting part of it that, that generates the money. So to help us manage deer in Maryland, we have a, we have a deer management plan, a 10-year plan. Uh, we are in the second reiteration of that plan. Uh, it's a 2009 to 2018. It basically tells who we are, what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and what our goals are. Um, and one of the more important things it does is it outlines our, our primary management options, which which you know include hunter, hunter harvest, uh, crop damage permits, uh, deer cooperator permits, sharp shooting, uh, and then some of the non-lethal um, components of fencing, repellents, deer resistant plants, and uh, and then some more in the research side of it still, and more more so than manage actual management or deer contraceptives and sterilization. So, talk a little bit about each of these. Um, the annual hunter harvest, um, that will, is our primary tool in the toolbox, and it will remain the primary tool in the toolbox for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, hunters in Maryland remove 50,000 female deer every year from the population. Um, those 50,000 in three years could easily be over 100,000 on the landscape. Um, so it's our most effective tool for helping control deer numbers. You can see early on, we started hunting again in 1927. And the early focus was was on bucks or antlered, um, and even up there through the 70s, we were only harvesting 10,000 or fewer deer. We hit that exponential growth. The part, uh, department started to adjust and started to ramp up the antlerless harvest, which is the tan component here. And you can see how much more antlerless deer we now harvest compared to antlered deer in an effort to stabilize that population. So, so you know, hunters play a large role in, in managing deer every year by removing those 50,000 deer. Um, and, and we don't pay them to do it. They actually pay to do it through, through license fees, which, again, that money goes to manage a whole host of other wildlife species. As far as our seasons and bag limits go, we're very liberal in the state. Uh, archery season starts in early September and runs through January 31st, and during also from that for during those five or six months, we have a host of, of muzzleloader and firearm seasons. We have a, le at a minimum of a 36 deer bag limit uh, from Washington County east. Um, so and, and if you're hunting with uh, archery equipment, we have an unlimited antlerless bag limit in that region. That's known as Region B, which includes the eastern part of Washington County and, and everything to the east. In Garrett and Allegheny counties in the west and the western part of Washington County, we have a six-deer bag limit. Uh, we have to be a little bit more conservative in that part of the state. We have a higher number of hunters, more access to deer, and, and habitat isn't quite as productive. But in both of these cases, uh, the antlerless bag limit, it, it, it's heavily skewed towards the antlerless bag limit. 
Um, you can take three, four antler deer a year um, in, in the state, and the rest have to be antlerless deer. So, so skewed toward antlerless deer to help maintain or help control that population. As I mentioned, we have an unlimited antlerless deer bag limit for our tree hunters in Region B. Uh, our seasons and bag limits encourage the harvest of antlerless deer. And we have a liberal allowance of weaponry. We allow modern muzzle loaders with scopes. We allow crossbows during the archery season, et cetera. So, so we're, we're, we're growing the kitchen sink at, at, at range and deer in, in Maryland. As I mentioned, crop damage permits are also an important tool. Uh, currently, farmers can use crop damage permits year round, and, uh, and they're taking about 8,000 deer a year. Uh, farming gets more expensive every year. And uh, to watch those, those profits be consumed by deer, um, it's, it's less tolerable now than, than what it was in the past. Other lethal control measures, deer cooperator permits, the Department of Natural Resources, we, we will license individuals to be uh, deer removal experts, so to speak. They have to take a written test. They have to take a shooting test. And then we have to re approve any work plans that, that they submit to actually remove deer on a professional uh, for pay uh, type operation. Um, we currently have between five and ten deer cooperators in the state. Um, so it's not a real popular program, but in, in some of these urban and suburban areas where there's just no other alternative, um, they can be effective in, in helping control deer numbers. Um, there's also some sharpshooting. Um, that's really associated with those deer cooperator permits, but, but USDA, the Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services, they do some sharpshooting on contract, and then some of the urban counties, uh, Howard County, Montgomery County, Baltimore County, uh, they also employ sharpshooters in some of their more densely populated areas where they really need to do deer control, but, but there's no other way to really control those deer. Um, we also issue letters of authority to airports. Um, Deer can be a real danger on runways, and uh, so some of these airports will get a letter of authority from us to control deer outside of the regular season. And then managed hunts are also popular at the county level and also on some state parks. Um, you know, regular hunters are used most of the time in these managed hunts, but, but it's a more defined season. Most times they have stands that they have to be at, so it's more, it's much more tightly regulated. Okay, so Chad asked, why has the DNR not required the harvest of two or three does prior to any buck? That's a good question, Chad, and, uh, you know, we have entertained that idea in the past of possibly requiring that. Um, that is, that's really aggressive, and, and I don't know how successful that would be. The way we are structured right now, though, is, is we have a three antler deer bag limit with one bonus antler deer. And before you can take that bonus antler deer, you have to take two antlerless deer, or one antlerless deer, I'm sorry. So we have changed that. Um, so, or, or I should say, we do have a, a regulation similar to what you're suggesting, um, but it doesn't require the antlerless deer up front. But before you can get the bonus antler deer, we do require you uh, to take some antlerless deer. So, but require that requiring them up front, um, I'm concerned with our hunter numbers and, and what that might do to participation. And I'll touch on the hunter numbers here in, in, in a minute. John asks, are damage permits limited to does? When do they start issuing permits? Permits are, are, are available year round. Um, and they are by and large limited to antlerless or female deer, yes. Um, there are a few instances where a permit may be issued to a nursery because they're having rub damage from bucks. Um, so in that case, they will be permitted to take a limited number of bucks. But the vast majority of our permits are antlerless only or female only, yes. Okay, moving on to non-lethal options. Um, fencing can be effective. Um, on small scales, um, if it's a garden or maybe a smaller nursery, um, then fencing oftentimes will work to, 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 to help with deer problems. Um, fencing can be expensive and, of course, it requires maintenance and, and sometimes it can be unsightly. So there are some disadvantages to fencing, but, but from a non-lethal standpoint, it can be effective in, in, in helping control uh, deer damage. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with, with fencing is, is that 
you're not really solving the deer overpopulation issue, you're just moving it to, to somewhere else. Um, but fencing can work on, on smaller scales um, if, if the expense is, is justifiable. There also are deer resistant plantings. Um, there's quite a few websites and actually Maryland Extension, I did some work on this in the past as well, I believe. Um, but there are, you know, a list, there are listings of plants that, that are typically a little more deer resistant. Um, deer don't find them as palatable as, as some other species. And, and, uh, and if you plant them, they, they may not suffer the damage or incur the damage that, that some of the other species may. Repellents are vary, or, or there's, there's a wide number of repellents, some more effective than others. Um, Dogs can be very effective if, if you don't mind maintaining the dog. Um, they can, you know, and, and if they're trained correctly, they can do a good job of keeping deer away from nurseries or, or other important areas. Um, some of the other repellents on the market, um, it's really trial and error. Some will be effective. Some won't be effective. Some will start out being effective, but deer will, will adapt to them. So it, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, but again, these repellents don't solve the deer issue, overpopulation issue. They just move it somewhere else. Diane says they are hungry enough. It really doesn't seem to help. Yeah, Diane, I know what I know what you're saying. <laughs> they are very adaptable, and and they can they can learn to like a lot of different things. It seems I I, I understand clearly what you're saying. Okay, so, and then last is deer contraceptives and sterilization. So again, this, this is more on the research front than, than the management front. Um, but there is a contraceptive approved by EPA for deer, and it's actually approved for use in Maryland, and it's called Gonicon. And basically, it, it, it stops a female deer from producing estrogen and, and progesterone, so she never comes into heat. Or, or never cycles, so so it basically renders her infertile. Um, it since it's been approved in Maryland, there 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 hasn't been any permits issued, or or none of it has been applied in the state. Um, the the problems with with contraceptives and, and and sterilization as well. It requires the capture of the deer. You have to capture the deer. You have to immobilize the deer. You have to administer. The gonicon, or or perform the sterilization surgery, and then you can release the deer. And if, in the case of gonicon, uh, a year later or two years later, you have to recapture the deer again and readminister the vaccine. So, so that's what really limits its applicability on a free ranging deer herd. Um, if it's small scale, maybe behind a fence or or deer that are really acclimated to people in a, in a, in a small suburb. Possibly it could, you know, it could work in that case, but but by and large, on a large, you know, on a wide scale, um, unfortunately, the technology just isn't there yet. Um, both of these procedures are are, are expensive. Um, it's five hundred dollars and up per deer, and most of that, the vast majority of that expense is, is in the labor to actually capture the deer, restrain the deer. The contraceptive itself is is relatively inexpensive. Um, it's the labor involved with trying to catch those deer and administer it is, is what drives the cost up. Sterilization, um, again, you have to capture the deer, yeah, and then you have to perform field surgery. But it, with sterilization, at least once you release the deer, you never have to handle it again. Um, it, is, it is permanent, unlike, un, unlike Gonicon, where you have to recapture the deer at a future date. So um, I, you know, they're still working on some of this technology. Hopefully, we'll see some improvements. Um, Right now, it's just not ready for, for any kind of a wide scale use. So, challenges to deer management, and uh, you know, again, talking about Maryland, but 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 across the deer's range, a lot of this applies. Um, one of the first challenges is is decline in hunters and, and bag limit saturation. Um, I you know I told you that that hunting is our number one tool in the toolbox, and it will be for a long time, but but our batteries are starting to get low, unfortunately. Um, we're not recruiting new hunters, whether it's electronics or other sports or, or whatever. We're not recruiting younger hunters, unfortunately. And, and the hunters that we do have, you know, we, we have these big bag limits and long seasons, but, but they don't want to take that many deer a year. Um, so it, so it's, it makes things hard um, from a management standpoint. 
this is a pretty scary trend. Um, the dark charcoal is the resident Maryland hunters, and you can see it peaked back in the mid 60s, and it's been in decline ever since. Um, so, you know, we're losing hunters. The hunters that we have left are growing older. Um, the mean age is probably, or median age is probably 45 to 50. Um, so we're just not, we're, we're losing our hunters, and, uh, and we're not resupplying them uh, with young hunters, unfortunately. So, and again, this isn't just a Maryland phenomenon. This, this is happening pretty much across the East too many other things uh, to do. It's a busy society anymore. Another challenge is access to land to try to control deer. Um, there's a lot of private land in Maryland that isn't hunted um, and it just serves as a reservoir for deer to, to supply the, the landscape with deer unfortunately. And that's a hard one, just a hard issue to solve. Effective urban and suburban deer management. Uh, we have a biologist on staff, George Temko, who who's the main emphasis of his job is trying to deal with urban and suburban deer and how to control their numbers and, and, and uh, keep them in check and balance. If you look at this satellite photo, this is the 270 corridor coming down from Frederick, Gaithersburg, Rockville, Germantown, etc. You know how densely populated that area is and, and even in this area, the amount of green um, you know, this is all prime deer habitat, even in these heavily developed urban and suburban areas. Um, so it really makes urban and suburban deer management probably our biggest uh, biggest challenge and biggest issue in, in the state. Non-lethal technologies. I just talked to you about sterilization and, and gonicon, and, and we need to see that de that technology um, developed further. Um, you know, some of the some of this could be applicable in some of these urban suburban areas where there's just no other choice. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these technologies, um, you know, it would take the private sector to develop them, and, and the money's not there to support it. Um, there's no return on the dollar. So I think you know, that's one of the reasons why you see see that technology lagging behind. Gonicon was actually developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, so it was government government funded, and, and that's primary reason why we have it on the market today. Consensus on deer population levels and management strategies. This is a real tough one. Uh, you know, hunters want a certain level of deer from a recreation standpoint. Farmers want a lower number um, due to crop damage. Um, urban and suburban residents want another level. Um, so it's really difficult to get everybody on the same page and try to find a deer population level that appeases everybody. And then within groups, there's disagreement. Um, archery hunters have issues with muzzleloader hunters over season lengths and bag limits. Um, some farmers may want one level of deer, whereas other farmers may want a higher level of deer. So it's, it's very difficult to get consensus on deer population levels and what techniques you use to manage deer. And then crop damage issues. That's a big challenge for us. I already covered that. But, but trying to solve that issue and work with farmers to, 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 to alleviate or minimize some of that damage can be very challenging in, in today's world. And then last but not least, chronic wasting disease. I, I haven't talked about chronic wasting disease. This, this disease is in the same family as mad cow. Um, it's not a human threat. Um, however, there are still concerns about it. And we do have uh, one positive case in Allegheny County. And the big concern with chronic wasting disease is, is oftentimes hunters won't hunt in areas where there is chronic wasting disease. So it makes management tougher and it makes it harder to control populations as, as the disease influences where hunters hunt and where they don't hunt. Um, so we have been sampling for CWD since 2002. Um, and we spend a fair amount of money every year. Uh, monitoring this disease and, and watching its effects. And as Doug mentioned, access to hunting land seems to be the biggest deterrent for hunters. They just keep building everywhere. That's very true. It's, access is, is a very big issue. Um, and it, it's difficult to recruit new hunters into the fold when they don't have very many places to hunt. Um, so it makes it tough. We have some excellent public hunting ground in Maryland, and a lot of it is underutilized. Um, but but there is you know, a stigma associated with public land sometimes, and, and there's no there's no question that the access um, limits our recruitment to to a certain degree. 
So future options as far as management goes, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, we need to see some of these, these technologies increase. We need to figure out a way to keep our hunters hunting. We need to determine how to get new hunters into the, into the mix. And, and those are issues that, that our department are focusing on. Um, re hunter recruitment and retention is a big deal. Um, and it's a big part of, of what we do um, um, every year. So, so we'll keep working on it. But, but it's very challenging. So just to end up, um, or to, to, to finish up, um, just a little bit about private land deer management. Again, I think most of our people that are, that are, that are on board here are, are small owners, um, less than an acre maybe. But, but just, to, just to talk about private land deer management, you can really think of it in, in two, two parts. Number one is to provide habitat for food, shelter, and water for the deer. But more importantly, as pretty much this whole presentation is focused on, is to keep deer numbers in check and in balance. That's the critical part because most often than not, it's real easy to get deer. It's harder to get rid of deer. Um, water and shelter are self-explanatory. Deer can get water from a wide variety of sources, um, and shelter is important. You know, deer use a forest, forested cover um, every day of their lives, so, so providing some kind of shelter essential, um, whether it's on your property or a neighbor's property or, or an adjacent public ground. Um, as far as the food component goes, again, deer eat a wide variety of foods in the spring and early summer. Um, they'll rely on forbs and woody plants, whether it's oak seedlings or, or a farmer's soybeans or, or corn or, or a jack in the pulpit or other, or other forbs. Um, you know, in the spring and early summer, they're going to be relying on a lot of these green plants. Um, when you move into late summer and fall, um, they'll shift to mast. Um, acorns are a huge part of their diet. Um, and, and other things like hickory, persimmons, um, you know, they'll eat a large variety of mast um, during the winter, fall and winter. Sometimes I get questions about food plots. Um, people that are really interested in intensely managing deer will ask, what can I plant for deer? Um, I generally discourage that as there's plenty of uh, other food plots out there already and other, plenty of other food sources. Um, but if you do have some, some, some open land that you want to, that you want to plant for deer, um, clover is, is, is a real good choice, benefits a wide variety of species. But, but again, um, I would more concentrate on the, on the shelter part, um, and, and wouldn't necessarily jump into putting a food plot in expressly for deer because there's plenty of food sources out there already. Um, so the second part, the more important part of this managing deer for private lands is to keep your deer numbers in check and in balance because deer do affect whether it's your small one acre property or a five acre piece or, or a 5,000 acre piece. Um, deer have significant impacts on those wooded areas. Um, over browsing, consuming of the mass so other wildlife species don't get it, antler rubbing on young trees, and, uh, and just overall eating the understory and reducing habitat for other wildlife are serious issues. And then also by eating all those native species, um, they actually give a boost to invasive uh, non-native plants. Um, but oftentimes things like barberry um, will take over uh, you know, in place of those native species that you'd rather have. Um, just to stress how, how this can be, you know, these arborvitae, were, this is deer damage on these arborvitae. And, uh, and deer are doing this to your woodlots or your one acre property or whatever as well. You may, you just might not be able to see it. But, but deer do consume a lot of food every day. And they do a lot of damage. So with that being said, you know, to keep deer numbers in check, you have to focus on harvesting female deer. Um, she, you know, because she's the one, you know, she's given birth to the fawns. Um, she's the one that's contributing these deer to the population. So by removing her from the population, you can remove her offspring and her offspring's offspring. Um, you know, a lot of hunters like to hunt bucks, um, but, but you know, if you remove him from the population, you're just removing one deer, and there will always be another buck there to, to take his place. Um, and it actually has a secondary benefit in that you know, if you do pass up these, these bucks, particularly these younger bucks, um, and instead focus on the female, it allows these younger bucks to grow another year, another two years, and uh, they will result in a bigger antler deer, and, and, and hunters oftentimes look at that more favorably. So, so, you know, I can't stress enough keeping deer numbers in check if you are involved in any kind of, of, of woodland management uh, practice. Make sure you don't have too many deer on your properties. Make sure you actively manage the deer you do have. 
make sure you or, or, or any hunters that are hunting on your property are, are harvesting an adequate number of protein. And as far as how many to harvest, um, that's a good question on smaller properties where, where you know, deer are sharing two, three, four, five property owners. It's a little difficult. Um, we'll often, often encourage um, um, in, that, in that situation to, to try to work with your neighbors. Um, it can be more effective. And you know, but it, but but the general rule: if you harvest twenty to thirty percent of the does or females out of the population, that'll stabilize population growth. Um, but it can vary, you know, from from area to area. But, but by and large, um, it, it it's difficult to over harvest an area if you're using hunting to manage that property. It's difficult to over harvest. Um, deer are very fertile and, and, and can rebound quickly. There's a whole host of available resources out there. Um, you know, the DNR website, the Forest Extension, Maryland Extension website, um, and then there's also a whole host of private organizations as well. Um, if you're interested in managing for deer or, or managing um, you know, for quality deer, um, one that comes to mind is the Quality Deer Management Association. They, they do a pretty good job of, of, of promoting a balanced deer herd with, with healthy deer. And with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up. John asks, how old do fawns need to be to survive if harvesting does with crop damage permits? John, generally by, by eight weeks to ten weeks, they can, they can survive on their own. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. We're going to uh, do a couple more things here before we wrap things up. And if you have any other questions that come to mind, go ahead and uh, type them in. But before we wrap things up for the day, we've got a couple more questions for you to take a look at. Uh, give us some feedback on, on what we've talked about today. And appreciate your feedback. You can see the, see the results as things come up. And while we're, we're talking about that, um, the, the one in the middle and the bottom might be uh, might be a little hard to quantify. What I've learned today will save me the following amount of money in the next year. Think of it this way: How much do you think it would it would cost for you to consult a, a professional? Hire Brian to come out. Uh, he he's he's holding up a sign that says it says ten thousand. No, uh, people want to get some some feedback on how much uh, a professional would would. Uh, would cost to to come out and figure out what it would uh, would cost to manage deer on your property. So that's what uh, what we're looking for in that sort of idea. So give us some feedback, and if you have any other questions, we'll we'll take them in just a minute. Looks like we've we still have uh, have some results coming in. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, close the first couple of polls here. Move on to closing the ones in the middle. And then we'll close the last couple. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions, so we'll just wrap up with uh, just a couple more things to to, uh, to tell you about in the in the webinar series, we have one more scheduled this year, uh, this this summer into sp spring into summer, I should say, and and uh, Diane has some uh, some excellent advice at the end. She says, "Eat more venison." Sounds like a marketing tag right there. Uh, we usually have these in the first week of the month, but we have one more scheduled that's coming up towards the end of June, on June 27th, which is uh, with Jonathan Kays and Tom Skaggs of the Under Outdoor Underwriters Incorporated. They're going to be talking about hunting leases, associated liability, and appropriate insurance. That'll be at 12 o'clock noon on Thursday, June 27th, so that'll be three weeks from today. And we invite you to come back and join us then. In the meantime, if you have any other questions, you can get a hold of me at aclaim1 
at umd.edu. If you have any other questions for Brian, you can shoot them to me, and I'll shoot them on to him, and we'll get the feedback to you as soon as we can. And once again, thank you for joining us today. We'll send out an email notification to let everyone know when the recording is available so everyone can learn what uh, reinforce what we saw today and share with all of your friends who couldn't join us today. So once again, thank you very much for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.